Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome. Welcome back if you were here last week for uh, a couple of events that we put on. Um, and I'd also like to say a, a special welcome to anybody who's come here from the Oxford and Cambridge Society, because I myself received an invitation uh, from that society, which I didn't know about until I received the invitation. So, um, welcome. And I'd like to welcome any of, any anybody from school, from from pupils I see in the front row. It's great to see you. Um, my job really is to is to just kick things uh, off this evening. Um, I just wanted to say a quick word because we've. Anybody who's educated in England, I was educated in England from eight years old, knows about Magna Carta. And if I think back at my history uh, from, from prep school, and there's the certain dates that stick in one's mind, 1066, of course, and 1588, which was the, the year of the, the Armada, and then 1215. Of course, everybody laughed when we learned about 1215 because we all thought that this was a document that was signed at a specific time of day but it, it's always helped us remember, everyone always remembered the, the significance of 1215, of, of the document that was signed between Bad King John and the Barons. Um, it's, of course, a document that's had a, a complex textual um, and legal history, being reconstituted and revivified uh, several times since 1215. Lord Denning has called it the most important constitution constitutional document of all time. He was the master of the roles. I don't know if that's hyperbole or not. Uh, in any event, um, what I'd like to do now is to um, introduce uh, His Excellency, the British Ambassador, Philip Parham, who's, as most of you I'm sure will know, is, is uh, new to the UAE. He came here in July this year uh, and replaced uh, His Excellency, Dominic Jer Jeremy, who's gone on to other pastures. Um, uh, Ambassador Parham um, has been uh, posted in in several places. Um, notably, uh, he was the uh, the ambassador to New uh, in New York to the United Nations. He was High Commissioner in Tanzania. Um, he's been posted in Washington, Southeast Asia. His some of his remits have included um, security and counterterrorism, I believe, and he. Also, he came to the, to the diplomatic or uh, from a background in business, having been in business for 10 years. Um, I'm very grateful to um, Ambassador Parham for really being the driving force behind this evening's event. So uh, please welcome uh, His Excellency Philip Parham. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Philip. Uh, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, I'm absolutely delighted that this event is happening, and it certainly, despite what Philip just said, is not happening thanks to me, but thanks to others. Uh, but it's great that it is happening, and I'm delighted that you are here to participate in it, and I'm very grateful to all of you for coming. Um, and I'm extremely grateful to NYU for generously hosting this event and for collaborating with the embassy to bring together uh, two of the world's leading experts to educate us on the significance of this octocentenary. That's the first time I've, I've said that. I'll say that word. I'd like to just... Is this working? A couple of people. Um, Niels Lewis and Professor Mark uh, Swiss Lucky from the university who have done a lot to make this happen this evening, and Olivia Tunnell from the Embassy, who has also um, been vital to the organization. Uh, and a big thanks to Lubna Kasim for being here this evening to chair the discussion, uh, but also for all her encouragement and support uh, in organizing the event. Uh, to anyone who knows her, she is uh, absolutely irrepressible and unstoppable. And in fact, uh, last week, I happened to overhear a conversation in a completely different context uh, between two women, one of whom was saying to the other, did she know that Lubna had been tweeting only 10 minutes after giving birth a few months ago? Um, now, we also have here this evening uh, our academic stars who have come from afar, uh, stars who've come to the East, as it were, to illuminate all these wise men and wise women uh, who've come here this evening to listen to them. And uh, one of them 
uh, immediately on my right is Professor David Carpenter, Professor of Medieval History at King's College London. And like me, he had the good sense and the good fortune to study at Christchurch, Oxford. Um, and he is a world export, expert in the uh, social, economic, military, political, and architectural history of 13th century England. Um, his book, The Struggle for Mastery in Britain, 1066 to 1284, uh, describes how the rulers of England, Scotland, and Wales uh, competed for mastery. Now, we all know that history doesn't repeat itself, but I have a feeling that there may be some lessons there for 21st century Britain. Professor Thomas Cogswell, our other academic star, is Professor of History at the University of California, Riverside, and according to his post on the university website, his career in history has been a long-running ruse to avoid the, and I quote, seemingly inevitable slide from undergraduate degree to law school. Uh, and it's been an extraordinarily distinguished way of playing truant for several years. He has fellowships with the American Council of Learned Societies, the National Humanities Center, the National Endowment for the Humanities, the Folger Shakespeare Library, the Huntington Library, the John Simon Guggenheim Foundation, and of course, best of all, Wadham College, Oxford. Uh, and we're all looking forward to the energy and the light which the fusion of these two great historical minds is going to produce for us this evening. I have to admit a slight conflict of interest on two grounds. One is that uh, I'm actually quite an admirer of Pope Innocent III, who annulled Magna Carta, uh, and I'm also a, a 24 times great-grandson of King John. But despite those biases, I am uh, very pro-Magna Carta. And uh, Philip quoted uh, from Lord Denning, and I have the full quote here, which is that, it's the greatest constitutional document of all times, the foundation of the freedom of the individual against the arbitrary authority of the despot. And there is no doubt that whatever its genesis and its original application, Magna Carta is a touchstone for the rights of the individual, for the protection of the individual against unwarranted interference by the state, and for proper interaction between the individual and the state. And over the last 800 years, the principles of Magna Carta have been developed, encoded, and implemented all around the world. The most recent example of this, I would say, happened in New York only last month, when the new Global Goals for Sustainable Development were agreed by all 193 members of the United Nations. Sustainable Development Goal number 16 is focused on peace, justice, and strong institutions. And the targets associated with that goal include promoting the rule of law and ensuring equal access to justice for all, developing accountable and transparent institutions, ensuring responsive, inclusive, participatory and representative decision making, and protecting fundamental freedoms. And I think we can clearly hear Magna Carta echoing through those words. And our task is to ensure that the principles of Magna Carta continue to guide societies and that every centenary sees them more, more broadly and more deeply entrenched. And I know that this event this evening is going to help us do that. Thank you very much. Good evening. Is this working all right? I'm delighted to be here, and thank you very much, uh, Ambassador Philip and uh, Professor Philip, for your kind words and for your kind introduction. I am assisted today uh, with distinguished speakers, uh, leading authorities on the subject of Magna Carta. And we shall start with Professor David Carpenter. Well, thank you very much. It's a great privilege and pleasure to be here, and I'm slightly intimidated because, unlike most of you, I heard Lubna give an introduction to a talk I gave on Magna Carta this morning uh, in Dubai, Magna Carta and Money, and you were so knowledgeable about it, I thought I could more or less hand the talk uh, over to you. Anyway, as I came out of the airport um, yesterday, um, seemed already a long time ago, there was this wonderful um, slogan up which said, a country which has no past has no future. And I thought immediately of the past of Magna Carta and 800 years. 
And it is, yes, so appropriate because it's 800 years this year that King John authorized the writing out and the sealing of Magna Carta in that meadow of Runnymede between Windsor and Staines um, in England and by the River Thames. And this is my first meeting with uh, Magna Carta in my nursery history of England. And you can see there's the scene at Runnymede with King John. And I'm glad to see, I think there's a little stamp there. So he is going to seal it, there's Magna Carta, not sign it, which is so often said. This wasn't a mistake you made this morning, uh, Luma. And um, if we go on, Magna, uh, Runnymede is a very atmospheric place. There's a, it's in a 19th century picture with Windsor Castle in the distance. There's Runnymede, there's the River Thames. And the great aeroplanes which take off, like uh, myself yesterday from London Heathrow, there it is, they come up over Runnymede and they fly down the whole of its length. And it is symbolic in a way because it's as though they're taking Magna Carta around the world. And yes, Magna Carta, as, as Philip said, has become the most, and as Lord Denning said, uh, one of the most famous, the most famous document in world constitutional history. Tremendously important to the founding fathers of the United States of America, cited by them again and again, cited in all many Supreme Court decisions today about the American Constitution, um, still part very much of the political debate in Britain. And so here it is 100 years ago being uh, appealed to for votes for women. Uh, here it is in a Guardian cartoon just after the, uh, the English election with um, David Cameron uh, issuing his own uh, version of Magna Carta. I'm glad to say it was sealed. So why is it so important? And I think it is because it does assert a fundamental principle um, that the ruler is subject to the law, that he can't just say off with your head into prison. If he wants to act against you, he has to do so by due legal process. And um, those two most famous chapters of the Charter which assert that principle are still on the statute book of the United Kingdom today. So 39, no free man is to be arrested, imprisoned, dispossessed, outlawed, exiled, or in any way destroyed, nor will we go against him, nor will we, oh, misprint, uh, it should be, nor will we uh, send against him, save by the lawful judgment of his peers or by the law of the land. And to no one will we sell, to no one will we deny or delay right or justice. Now, that principle was not new in 1215. The principle that the ruler is subject to law is centuries old already. What's new about Magna Carta is the sheer detail in which it is asserted. In a Latin document, 3,500 words long, 63 chapters, with a whole series of do's and don'ts. So those most famous chapters are just part. You see, they're already 3940 of a whole series of regulations um, gov uh, controlling government and subjecting the king to the law. So it's the detail in which it's done and the putting of it down into black and white. Now, what I thought I'd do briefly today is to talk about three main things. I'll say something about, well, first of all, something about the documents themselves. Secondly, something about the causes. Thirdly, something about the nature of the Charter. Was it then actually just a selfish document in which an elite were looking after their own interests? And actually, fourthly, I'll say something about its impact and survival. So let's think a little bit about the actual document. Now, as Lubna very rightly said, which showed how you researched it, uh, in 1215 itself, there wasn't just a single Magna Carta. We know from this record here, uh, which John, King John kept on his chancery rolls, that actually 13 Magna Cartas were issued in the month after Runnymede, all the same type, same document, all with equal validity. And of those, four are known to survive. Now, one of them is now at Lincoln. Um, let's just see if I can click on to that um, here. And this is the Lincoln Magna Carta, kept at Lincoln Cathedral. One is at Salisbury Cathedral. You can just see where the seal there has been probably ripped off. And two are now in the British Library. Here's one of them. It doesn't look terribly uh, exciting. And then here is the other one, which I'm showing you in the splendid 1733 engraving, because, wait for it, the original now looks like that. And it was reduced to that by injudicious attempt at re restoration. 
in the 19th century. But at least it's still got a bit of its seal. It's the only one which has. I mean, that's what the seal would have looked like originally. Um, that's a wonderful seal of King John uh, on a charter issued to London just before Runnymede. So, uh, of course, the original doesn't have these splendid coats of arms. Uh, the engraver painted them there to make his engraving of this Magna Carta more marketable. So that's the document itself. And I think you can see how, the, from the capital letters, it was uh, divided up into separate chapters for, um, there. Um, so um, can I think then a little bit about the causes of the Charter? And I think they were threefold. The first is, of course, money, money. Because the major aim of the Charter was to restrict the king's ability to take money from his subjects. And chapter after chapter of the Charter is doing that. It's limiting the king's revenues. Now, why was that necessary? Well, I think we get a clue of that. There is King John on his tomb in Worcester Cathedral. And I think we get a clue if we actually look at the titles that John has at the start. Because at the start of the Charter, John is, by the grace of God, King of England. Lord of Ireland, but he's also Duke of Normandy and Aquitaine and Count of Anjou. Now, it was the cost of maintaining that continental empire which was the major cause of the Charter, because, and maybe uh, there are parallels with the EU uh, today, uh, but John was having to defend this great continental empire, the whole of the western side of France, against the very aggressive and powerful king of France. And to do that, he had to use English resources. And in the course of his reign, wait for it, John tripled his revenues, tripled his revenues from England. Well, imagine what would happen in, in Dubai or anywhere else uh, in England if the, if the tax burden was tripled. Well, that's what happened in England in the early 13th century. So that was one major cause of the Charter. The second was King John and his predecessor's uh, treatment of individuals. And this is where Chapter 39 is so important. Because if, king, if you fell from King John's favour, he would seize your property, he might imprison you. He wouldn't execute you. Executions are not... Uh, no, 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 murders are, I'll come on to that. And uh, John's natural reaction was simply to seize property without lawful process, a means of disciplining his great barons. And that's why the Charter says, no free man is to be arrested or dispossessed, save by the lawful judgment of his peers or by the law of that. And that was a direct reaction to the arbitrary, many would have said at the time, tyrannical rule of the king. Now, the third cause of the Charter was King John's personality. Now, King John was, if you'll excuse my language, a sh**. And uh, when I actually said that on a, a, a very popular radio programme in uh, England, uh, chaired by uh, Melvin Bragg, Lord Bragg, I remember his hair standing up and him going like this to me desperately to sort of don't use bad language at nine o'clock on Radio 4 on a, a, a Monday morning. And he said to me afterwards, I nearly got the programme taken off the air. But the truth, <laughs> it's true. I said, well, I'm sorry you must blame King John. Because King John was cruel, he was violent, he was a murderer. And this is a period when, you know, the nobility uh, treat each other in a very chivalric way. Uh, in the normal course of English politics, Anglo-Norman politics, you would not expect to be killed by the king in any way. It's quite unlike the Tudor period. Well, John is acting outside the conventions of the age in the way he treats and indeed murdered the most prominent woman of the age, Matilda de Breo, starved her to death in the vaults of Corf Castle. So John's personality is a major, major cause of the Charter. Now, can I come on next to say something a little bit about the nature of the Charter? Now, here it's often said that the Charter is essentially, you know, what is all this fuss this year? Because really all Magna Carta is, is a selfish, baronial document in which the great nobles are looking after their own interests with scant regard for the interests of the great bulk of, of the population. Indeed, worse than that, the Charter is in some ways being used by a noble elite uh, to keep the great bulk of the population in its place. Now, there is some truth in that. And actually, you can see the truth in this very first, most famous of all chapters. Because what does it say? It doesn't say no man, no man is to be arrested, imprisoned. It says no free man is to be arrested, imprisoned. 
So in other words, if you're unfree, if you're a villain or serf, you are not protected by that chapter. Now, in this room, of course, you are all very distinguished, and none of you would be villains or serfs. But if we could take you back uh, and make you a sort of representative uh, English population of 1215, I'm afraid to say that probably two-thirds of you would be villains or serfs. And so only you group over, well, make the ambassador, of course, <laughs> and, uh, and, and, and sitting in, in the front row here, clearly a, a lord. Uh, but the great bulk of you are going to be uh, villains and serfs. So you are not protected by this clause. And indeed, you don't actually get any of the liberties in the charter at all, because the liberties in the charter, the privileges in the charter, are granted only to the free. So the unfree are not protected by them. It's worth thinking a little bit about what about women, too, in the Charter, because it says no free man, doesn't it? Well, I think actually it's, not, it's more positive than that, because I think the sense in 1215 that man, homo, in Latin, means human being, and therefore is not gender just for men. I think that was known, and I think women would have been protected by that Charter, but also by that chapter, but actually also the, protect, the chapter reflects the lack of a role for women um, in public life. Because you see, it goes on. No free man, okay woman too, is to be arrested and all the rest of it. So by the lawful judgment of his peers. Well, if women are protected by that, they have to be protected by men. Because women don't appear in court and give judgments. Women don't sit on juries. Women have a very limited place in public life. And so the charter actually reflects that throughout. And it names King John and 38 men it doesn't name a single woman. So in that sense, too, the charter is discriminatory. And actually, the one chapter in the charter, chapter 54, which actually puts, um, which actually uses the word woman, femina, is actually designed to put women on a lower level when it comes to making accusations of, of homicide. So women are actually put below men in that quite important uh, area. Now, does this mean, then mean that Magna Carta is then just a selfish baronial document? Now, this has been powerfully argued in England this year, indeed by no one, uh, by someone very distinguished called Jonathan Sumption, Lord Sumption, who is a justice of the Supreme Court and is also a distinguished medieval historian. He wrote a powerful argument. Saying, Why all this fuss about Magna Carta? Surely we don't need Magna Carta to protect our rights when it is just a selfish baronial document. Well, actually, I live quite close to um, Lord Sumption in Greenwich, though I must say in a much less grand house. And when I read this, I thought, well, yes and no. And so what I did is, and this is where I put in a plug for my new book on Magna Carta, uh, published by Penguin, only £10.99, and it, it says... The book is a landmark in Magna Carta studies, and I can't blame Penguin for that piece of hyperbole, if such it is, because I wrote it myself. Um, <laughs> but anyway, I got on my bicycle and I cycled round to Lord Sumption's house with a little note saying, if you'd like to read my book, um, he would know, know better. And I put it through a letterbox. And then I cycled back down the wall of Greenwich Park, and as I was cycling along, I suddenly heard this voice shouting out, stop, stop! And, you know, I thought, um, golly, what has happened? Uh, my last hour may have come, because presumably Justice the Supreme Court is surrounded by all this kind of security. And no doubt they thought I'd put a bomb through the, the letterbox. And so, uh, but actually it was Lord Sumption himself who was running after me and took me back to the, uh, his, his grand house, and um, we had an argument about it. Well, I'd like to uh, say I persuaded him of the error of his ways. Uh, I don't think I could say that. But... Um, what did I say to him? I said, look, it, everything I, I've just said now is true, but actually Magna Carta is far, far more than just a baronial document. It reaches out to a much wider community. There's an important chapter on the liberties of the church. The, the liberties of London are protected in other towns. The role of the knights in the whole reform of local government is recognised. The very, very important chapters, a huge raft of chapters of restricting the abuses of the king's local government officials. And they would benefit everyone. The benefit would percolate down to the unfree. And also there are very important chapters expanding the common law, the whole, which is open to all free men. And in some ways that cuts against baronial interest. So this whole idea that the charter is just a selfish baronial document is completely untrue. If it had been, it would never 
have survived. It actually reaches out to a very broad community. And of course, these fundamental principles that the king is subject to the law, you know, they are forever, for all time. And ultimately, of course, no free man is, it, it, only a, a hundred years after Magna Carta, is actually glossed as meaning no man of any estate. So it reaches out to everybody. Now, can I, in conclusion, last five minutes, just say something about how the Charter survived and its impact. Now, at the end of 1215, you would have thought Magna Carta was a failure without a future because King John had got the Pope, um, as Philip said at the start, to uh, quash it. And why? Because what was King John's attitude to the Charter, a slippery customer that he was, he thought, I'll grant this Charter, um, everyone will thank me for it, and they'll all go home, and there'll be peace, and then they'll forget about the details. In other words, it'll never be enforced. Once he found that the barons had every intention of enforcing it to the letter, he gets the Pope to quash it. But funny enough, the barons also abandoned the charter because they sort of said it's not working. And so what they did is they deposed King John and they offered the throne to the eldest son of the King of France, Louis, who invaded England in 1216. And he had no brief for the charter at all. His attitude was, I come from this wonderful Capetian French dynasty against whom no word of criticism ever been raised. You don't need the charter with me around. Um, so how does the charter survive? Well, it only survives because of King John's death. And when King John died in October 1216, uh, he left his nine-year-old son in an absolutely terrible situation, the young Henry III, because Louis was controlling well over half the kingdom. And so what the governors of, the, of Henry III did, the minority government of Henry III, is they thought the only way to save the monarchy uh, is to change course completely and to accept what King John has rejected, and so they issued a new version of Magna Carta, which is that. They issued this charter of October 1216, which is basically the 1215 charter with some changes. And then when they'd won the war, they issued another version in 1217. I think they won it very largely because of this change, of course. And so they issued the 1217 charter. And then finally, in 1225, Henry III himself, in return for a great tax, issued what becomes the final and definitive charter of 1225. And it's actually the charter of 1225 and its chapters which is still on the statute book. Now, it's only, and they also issued another charter dealing with the royal forest. And it's only then that the term Magna Carta comes into being because it was needed. Great charter, it means physically bigger than this charter governing the royal forest. And there I'm showing you now, which isn't very often shown, the very, very first appearance of the word Magna Carta. It's not in a document itself, itself. that's in a proclamation of 1218 in which the clerk has to distinguish between the small charter dealing with the royal forest and the big charter, which is King John's charter in revised version. And so he thinks, how should I describe the physically bigger one? Well, not surprisingly, he calls it Magna Carta. Now, does, okay, so the charter in 1225 is the final definitive charter. Does it make a difference. Now, it's often been suggested that it didn't really, that it was just guff. It was hive principles and it made no real practical difference. Now, that I think is absolutely wrong. I think in its first century, Magna Carta was a fundamental watershed between lawless and lawful rule, and it, it, it ushers in a new type of monarchy. And just two points there, and a lot of them come from new research about the reception survival of Magna Carta. Much of it set out, of course, in my book. The first is that people were fascinated by the detail of the Charter, that people copied it again and again. They commented on the different versions of the Charter. And, you know, it, it really is sinking very deep roots into the hearts and minds of the political community. The second is that many of its crucial chapters were actually obeyed. It was much more difficult for the king to take money from his subjects in arbitrary fashion. And so he needs now to replace what he's lost from arbitrary, tax, arbitrary uh, levies and instead get taxation general taxation given by the kingdom. And Magna Carta says, for that, you need consent. So, in other words, we move from a monarchy which pounces on individuals and gets large sums of money from them to a monarchy which is getting its money from taxation levied 
by Parliament. And that's why Magna Carta lays the foundations for a new form of monarchy, the tax-based parliamentary state. And by 1300, I think it has established the position from which it was indeed to go round the world, and also the position from which it was uh, revived by the commentators of the 17th century, 1620s, about which Thomas is now going to tell us. So thank you very much. Thank you. We've, we've all, we've all, you know, we've all come across the term Magna Carta in some form or the other in many, many years. And thank you, Professor Carpenter, for so beautifully and articulately teaching us and educating us all today about the history, the nature of Magna Carta, and how it has actually evolved. Now, you presented it so beautifully and clearly. Magna Carta, a charter, which has not only influenced generations for the past eight decades or more, but also influenced a number of countries across the globe. And we're going to come to Professor um, Cogwell shortly, who's going, to, you know, who's going to be presenting to us how has the Charter, how it has actually affected us in, in the modern day, um, and how it has globally influenced. But one, I think it's also worth mentioning, I know he, he did mention his book, but he's a very <laughs> modest man, um, and he hasn't told you how great it is. I, I have actually read your book, oh, and I know you don't like compliments, right. uh, but it's a superb book. I would definitely encourage you, um, you know, to read um, on a subject by leading a authority on Magna Carta. Now, something also which, you know, which is definitely worth mentioning is there are about, well, originally there were about 13 copies, right? 13 copies of the original Magna Carta. Does anybody have a clue how many remain only till this date? How many copies? Well done. I've got a very educated audience. This is fantastic. Um, before, before I continue further, um, I would like to invite Professor oh. Cogswell to present to us you know, the influence and the impact, and of course, from the, you know, from the American perspective. Yeah. Okay. You could focus on that. Thank you. So first of all, thank you for having me. It's a great honor to be here. Uh, the only drawback is I'm severely jet lagged, so I, I probably ought to work off a written comment. It's very impressive doing it on the fly, but I don't think I could do that. So on the 4th of July, 1940, as Americans began their annual national celebration, Nazi saboteurs were at work. They planted an explosive device in hopes of bringing the United States to its knees. The target reveals much about German priorities. They weren't attacking a major munitions plant or a vital transportation hub. Rather, they went for the juggler. They infiltrated Flushing Meadows, the site of the World's Fair, then in its second year. They slipped into the British Pavilion and left a canvas bag in a ventilation room. The bag stayed there for two days until a passing workman, he'd seen it on the first day, didn't think anything of it, saw it on the second day and he thought the bag is acting strangely. It was ticking. <laughs> Then cleverly, you only get this in New York City, cleverly, the workmen carried the bag into the exhibition hall where several hundred guests were then gathered. Eventually, the police were called and the bomb squad arrived. After calming the tourists, everything's going to be fine, the bomb squad's here, the bomb squad took the bag outside. Just when everyone was feeling at ease, the bomb exploded. It vaporized the two policemen and it created a crater five feet deep. Now, it's a terrible story, um, but the attack initially seems inexplicable until we realize the target. The British Pavilion held the Lincoln Cathedral copy of Magna Carta. Really? You know, what are they going after? Uh, there's an English aristocrat who sells his family's copy of the Magna Carta, a later edition of the Magna Carta, uh, and his famous line is, it's just a piece of old sheepskin, okay? It doesn't matter. It's a lamb hide. I, I got some money off it. I feel fine out of the matter. But the document that then was over 700 years old was important, and it still is. A few months before the German raid, the British ambassador had mused, why all the fuss and trouble about a medieval relic? The answer, he explained to American listeners, was simple. The principles that underlay Magna Carta are the ultimate foundations of your liberties, no less than ours. Hallowed and revered, the document nonetheless is more than a little unprepossessing. Crucial constitutional documents in the modern day generally are filled with far-reaching general statements, and there are certainly plenty in here. 
But Magna Carta also sets out rules on bridge repairs, restrictions on women's legal testimony. Likewise, it frees specific Welsh hostages, and it bans fish weirs, fish traps on the Thames. Most American undergraduates, say nothing of ordinary Americans, tend to be baffled by the document. The Huntington Library, where I am this year in Los Angeles, currently has a large exhibition on Magna Carta with an enormous blow up of the text, the translation of the text. When I went through the other day just to get a feel for how they were reacting, I could clearly hear the shock and saw the looks of incomprehension. Welsh princes? Fish traps? Really? But read more closely and the important clauses emerge. The English and ultimately all those affected by English legal tradition across the globe, uh, anyone based on common law, uh, which privileges custom and precedent, it, you realize that this is the, the gold standard, the older the better. King John's agreement, the barons, uh, fits the bill perfectly. Now, the importance of the charter waxed and waned in the late Middle Ages. And under Henry VIII, it had a brief revival, but it was used as a setting for an anti-papal play. Yet in the early 17th century, legal scholars, most notably Edward Cook, began reviving the document. Many of the finer points in the feudal context were lost on Cook, but he really wasn't fussed. The charter only, only affected knights, nobles, and freemen, as we've seen, a group that represented only a small percentage of the population. But that didn't matter to Cook. For him and his followers, the charter, what he thought it was in the charter, was an ideal weapon in his struggles with the Stuart monarchy. This is his famous quote, Magna Carta is such a fellow that he will have no sovereign. Using this motto, Cook and his friends then trumpeted two key aspects of the charter, Parliament's control over taxation and the due process of law in general and habeas corpus in particular. Now, thanks to the charter, English legal scholars like Sir John Fortescue knew what made England different from France. The English ruler had to work with Parliament, especially if he wanted new taxes while the French counterpart could safely ignore the Estates General. The importance of this doctoral, doctrine was, is undeniable. Henry VIII was one of the realm's most powerful monarchs, but in 1625, even he fell afoul of this custom. In his name, Cardinal Wolsey then began announced the amicable grant, sounds good, doesn't it? Which was a large uh, obligatory loan. Uh, but the project was dropped after it produced riots across the country. The rioters cited custom, and they cited Magna Carta. The incident would have been the first of many explosions over taxation had Henry not sidestepped the issue by seizing much of the enormous wealth of the church. But by the time of James I's accession in 1603, that massive windfall had been spent. The crown, again, needed money. In response, James began articulating his rights to raise funds without Parliament, and he acted on this principle by unilaterally raising import duties without parliamentary approval. The classic case is over current small raisins. In any event, Parliament protested and the courts backed the king. Words followed under James's son, Charles I. In 1626-27, he declared a national emergency which would not permit a Parliament and then launched another loan. As in 1525, this too met with protest and appeals to Magna Carta. To bully the nation into submission, Charles blundered over other key provisions of, uh, blundered into other key provisions of Magna Carta. Because Parliament had never approved the loan, those who refused to lend the king money had violated no law. Nevertheless, Charles imprisoned hundreds of protesters. Some of them retained counsel, and who in turn sued out writs of habeas corpus. No charge, no imprisonment, or so it seemed. But that writ, that writ now so hollowed, had largely been used by the crown, not by aggrieved subjects. Again, the courts found in favor of the crown. In 1628, however, Charles was Desperate for money, Parliament followed Cook's lead and pressured the highly reluctant monarch into accepting the Petition of Right. This document essentially reiterated and amplified Magna Carta. It banned on parliamentary taxation as well as arrest and imprisonment without due process of law. In essence, the idea of habeas corpus was shifting into its modern form. Yet again, Charles needed money. In the 1630s, ship money replaced the forced loan as the latest on parliamentary tax, and again, Charles was high-handed in suppressing dissent. When one aggrieved taxpayer protested in court that ship money violated Magna Carta, nine of the 12 judges loyally backed the king. The three, three however, found for the plaintiff and all lost their jobs. When confronted with the increasing references of the charter, James I and Charles I understandably became irritable, restive. And in the circumstances, it was only natural for them to go for the obvious, if unfortunate, rhyme. 
For them, the awkward charter had become Magna Farta, something they didn't want to hear about. <laughs> Not surprisingly, these perceived violations of Magna Carta loomed large in the Civil War of the 1640s. But the document itself proved highly adaptable. Parliamentary troops marched into battle under banners proclaiming their devotion to Magna Carta. But so too did the king's men. As Parliament quickly became high-handed, Charles's followers adroitly claimed that they were fighting for the rule of law. And even the levelers, who struggled for even more democratic rights for all Englishmen, not simply the gentry, regularly invoked the charter. Their leaders shouted, I build upon the great charter of England. And with increasing regularity, those in power, like Oliver Cromwell, began echoing earlier uh, pungent assessments of the document. Don't talk to me about this thing anymore, but it stays there. Order was restored in 1660 with the Restoration, and Parliament came to enshrine Magna Carta in political life, passing bills, reiterating the Commons' control over all money bills, and eventually, in 1679, establishing habeas corpus in statute. The problems remain. Um, better scholars began zeroing in on the Charter, pointing out how awkwardly it sat with contemporary interpretations of it. The clause about free men was one they would immediately go to. It's not what you think it says. Okay. Nevertheless, the Charter was involved in the furore over the exclusion crisis and over James II's um, efforts to impose religious toleration. The Glorious Revolution, as you know, in 1688-89, finally settled matters, and the Declaration of Rights confirmed Parliament's control over taxation and the subject's right to due process in habeas corpus. And for good measure, it terminated the king's ability to sack judges at will. After all, the legacy of these quarrels and an enhanced appreciation of the Charter spread across the British world. When the inhabitants of, the, of North American colonies came to draft their own constitutions, they invariably echoed key clauses of Magna Carta. Uh, I'll spare you, but we can do lots of comparisons, but they're constantly referring to it or using the language. In the mid-18th century, they came to challenge the crown, and then they skillfully deployed a reading of Magna Carta to justify their resistance. Naturally, the 1776 Declaration of Independence, the 1787 Constitution, and the 1789 Bill of Rights echoed the general sense of the Charter, and in places they actually use its actual language. Now, after a rather languid appreciation of this document in the, 18th, uh, the 19th century, the United States progressively went mad about Magna Carta in the 20th century. Uh, from very early in the 20th century, there was one American, one lone American in the Midwest, who began talking about what we need is an international Magna Carta Day. And by 16, excuse me, by, by 1929, he announced in the press, please stop sending me mail. He was so swamped with it, with letters coming out every day, he couldn't deal with it. In 1925, a Los Angeles crowd packed a hall to hear four Mexican high school students arguing the merits of the charter. The crowd gave them a loud applause, even though only two of them could speak English. But the, the trend peaked with the Cold War as Americans replaced Magna Carta, placed Magna Carta on the same pedestal as the U.S. Constitution, enlisted Bunker Hill with Runnymede. Needless to say, after the German attack on Magna Carta in 1940, the Americans moved the manuscript to the safest possible place, Fort Knox, where they placed it next to the U.S. Declaration of Independence. Uh, this was only just the beginning. Here are a few random facts. They organized not only the baronial order of Magna Carta, but there's also a separate national society of the de descendants of the signers of Magna Carta. The latter organization doesn't have a treasurer, but rather a keeper of the purse. Uh, in 1963, a slain African-American working on voter registration in the Deep South was found carrying a letter addressed to President Kennedy calling for a Magna Carta of human rights. In 1966, a UCLA sorority held a meeting discussing the document, and in 1967, it's one of my favorite examples, the Sportsman's Lodge on Ventura Boulevard held a ball for the lady lawyers' wives and the theme this year was the Magna Carta. You can imagine the conversations. Dear, I, I told them you wouldn't mind dressing up as King John. In, <coughs> in 1965, travel agents hawked cruises whose high point was a solemn visit to, to Runnymede. Hollywood joined in the frenzy. In 1942, when the courts allowed Olivia de Havilland to break her studio contract, it was predictably hailed as Magna Carta for actors. Throughout the 1950s, screenwriters wrestled with film treatments of events at Runnymede, but nothing ever went into, prediction, uh, into production. In 1957, after acting in a pirate movie, Anthony Quinn, that celebrated legal scholar, assured the public that freebooters, far from being lawless, operated with their own Magna Carta. In 1969, the aging Edward G. Robinson, 
denounced movies like Bonnie and Clyde and called instead for serious movies like maybe one about Magna Carta. He must have read that part for the early screenplays in the 50s and you want to get back in the business. The document regularly appeared in court cases, no less than, than the Supreme Court itself sided with two property owners who blocked building inspectors from entering their, their buildings um, and they had cited the, the Great Charter. Not so lucky was a citizen in 1959 who tried to use the charter to end the McCarthy era's loyalty oaths. In the 1950s, the American Bar Association built this impressive monument at Runnymede. And in 1955, the LA police chief knew how to grab attention when the courts tossed out a case in which his men had been found to use illegal wiretaps to collect information. Why, he said, this judgment represents nothing less than a Magna Carta for criminals. Meanwhile, the Great Charter became the, current cur the common currency in Washington. In 1945, Secretary Wallace called for a Magna Carta for small businessmen. In 1948, a congressional committee advanced plans for a Magna Carta for world defense, basically called for tripling the budget of the Air Force so they could constantly have planes overhead. In 1951, a columnist eager to drive Truman out of office uh, used Magna Carta to issue a call for a new baronial, or rather a senatorial revolt. In 1958, Senator Kennedy demanded a Magna Carta that would make urban voters equal with rural voters. In 1961, Senator Battle of Nevada pressed for a Magna Carta for silver producers. In the same year, railroad operators demanded a transport Magna Carta. Uh, in 1965, Edward Lansdale, who was the original ugly American, said victory was at hand against the Viet Cong, but only if the Vietnamese could develop their own Magna Carta. And in 1966, Lyndon Johnson dubbed the new Asian Development Bank the Magna Carta for Asians. Then two years later, never shy about recycling metaphors, he termed his new housing bill a Magna Carta for cities. <laughs> While the larger cultural residence of the Great Charter dwindled a little bit in the last few decades, it still remains strong. Uh, consider a few startling facts. In the 1930s, uh, only two cases were, were heard before the Supreme Court in that entire decade that cited the Charter. But by the 1950s, that figure for the decade rose to seven. And then from 1960, really, to the beginning of this century, it was used on average 17 to 18 times per decade. Unless we think Americans have grown immune to the timid charms of the Magna Carta, we must remember the case of H. Ross Perot in 1960, 1984. Um, he got up one morning and decided, I'm going to buy the Magna Carta. <laughs> there was one for sale. It was a, a later copy. Uh, had one of the great moments. He sent off an agent to go to the auction house and bought it. The agent called back, Mr. Perot, happy news, you, you own the copy of Magna Carta. How should we transport it home? We can have jet escorts, private jets, uh, special rooms in the Queen Mary, uh, the Queen Elizabeth. And he said, no, 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 just roll it up, take it home. Uh, put it in a tube. And so there was a great scene at Houston Airport. I, I, every time I go through an airport and I see the nothing to declare line, I think of this moment in 1964 where a man trudges up alone with a little tube and he explains to the board customs agent, I actually have the Magna Carta here. <laughs> anyway, I'm sorry. Uh, the only thing odder than a Texas billionaire purchasing uh, a later version of Magna Carta for one and a half million dollars was that in 2007, a private investment broker paid Perot 21 million dollars for his copy. Given the American mania about the charter, we can only sympathize with the 16-year-old who wrote to the LA Times in 1949, pleading, begging in public, that his civics classes could teach him something, anything other than the Magna Carta. In his desperation, he even begged for courses on the US Constitution. Now, American students would know that's pretty dire. You really wanted that. But in 1968, the connection between Magna Carta and the United States was so strong and so obvious that the same day that rioters blocked London streets to protest the Vietnam War, other demonstrators knew a better way to make their, their message heard. They bombed the American Bar Association's monument at Runnymede. They actually cracked it and they repaired it eventually. It's a powerful metaphor around the world. In 1917, the Chief Counsel of Standard Oil, he would know this, Chief Counsel of Standard Oil praised the new Mexican Constitution as worthy of Magna Carta. In 1959, Lord Roots, the British car manufacturer, said it was every Englishman's right to own a car and to drive it where he wished, and in support he cited Magna Carta. In 1957, the head of the Deutsche Bank asked for a Magna Carta for international commerce and in 19, excuse me, in, in 2009, the legislature in Manila passed the Philippine Magna Carta for women. Uh, and in, just go into popular culture, in 2013, the rap star Jay-Z issued an album, Magna Carta, okay? 
But the clearest legacy of the Charter can be seen in former colonies. In Australia, although the Charter has largely been superseded, many of the clauses, most of them had been superseded in British law, most of the clauses of Magna Carta are still in effect in various Australian jurisdictions. In 1840, British settlers signed the Treaty of Waitangi, which is now called the Maori uh, Magna Carta. In 1857, after long debates about the precise legal status of Indians, Queen Victoria issued a proclamation announcing that the residents of the entire subcontinent had the same legal rights as their English subjects. The Indian Constitution, like the American one, draws from the Magna Carta, as does the 1949 Objective Resolution of Pakistan. In 1914, Gandhi proclaimed the Indian Relief Act, um, a great advance, which he dubbed the Magna Carta for Indians in Natal province in South Africa. And in 1964, in his famous speech at his trial, Nelson Mandela repeatedly invoked the Great Charter. It's far from over. In 1990, Eight, the courts in Singapore announced that part of their constitution actually was drawn from Magna Carta. They established the connection. In 1999, Nigeria adopted a new democratic constitution, which they dubbed that country's Magna Carta. In 2006, when the king of Nepal was stripped of his wide-ranging powers, the event was hailed as the country's Magna Carta. And early in 2015, calls have been coming out of Malaysia for the country to adopt its own Magna Carta. Now, for all the vitality of the Great Charter down to the present moment, there are some problematical aspects. Due process and habeas corpus are central to any concept of freedom. To cite only the most obvious case, habeas corpus was at the heart of the 1772 Somerset case, in which Lord Chief, Stuff, Lord Chief Justice Mansfield barred a slave's owner from removing him against his will uh, from Britain. It, later they decide that slavery can't exist in Britain, but the key clause that got it into the court was habeas corpus. But in an emergency, the state can find the same liberties quite awkward. West Indian colonies in the 18th and early 19th century were periodically racked by slave revolts, and in repressing them, the governors didn't want to be troubled with legal niceties. The same logic ap applied across the empire. East India Company territories in Quebec in New Zealand, in Sri Lanka, in the early 19th century, we were all debating how do we play habeas corpus? Does it apply here? The question was, if we extend the doctrine of these territories, who gets to issue the writ? And there's a long uh, court case involving a runaway slave that gets to Canada in 1860, and the, the British courts attempt to intervene. The Canadians get upset. And so in 1862, Parliament actually issues a decree saying habeas corpus be left to representative institutions in the colonies. They can decide how they want to play it. Nonetheless, they left the question of emergencies. What do we do? Desperate to suppress the thuggy cult in India, for example, uh, British authorities there ordered all suspects to be arrested and sent into exile without trial. In the Boer War, they did the same thing to practically the entire Afrikaner population. And then again in Kenya in the 1950s with the Mau Mau's, and then in the 1970s in Northern Ireland with IRA suspects. But it wasn't just a British thing. Abraham Lincoln did the same thing, that is to say, suspending habeas corpus in Indiana and Ohio during the Civil War, and Franklin Roosevelt with Japanese Americans on the West Coast. The Americans are still doing it in Guantanamo Bay with men captured in Iraq and Afghanistan. But in this case, they're not actually suspending habeas corpus, they're engaging in what could be called jurisdictional chicanery. Since Guantanamo Bay isn't actually part of the United States, a U.S. legal writ has no force there. Now, it's the kind of logic you'd see Charles I lawyers going, oh, great idea. We should imprison people on the Isle of Man. That would work, wouldn't it? Uh, but just when this central clause of Magna Carta seems mere lip service, not honored that much, the events at Ronnie Mui proved crucial uh, in a major Supreme Court case, that you may remember, in 2005. Lakdar Boumedien was an Algerian working in Bosnia for an aid group. But the United States intelligence had fingered him for an involvement in a plot to bomb the U.S. Embassy in Sarajevo. They presented the as evidence to the Bosnian courts. The Bosnian courts decided, I, I, I can't make a case for arresting and detaining this man. So the United States kidnapped uh, Boumedien um, in 2002 and imprisoned him in Guantanamo Bay. All he demanded for years, he kept saying this over and over again, just tell me why I'm imprisoned, okay? He never got an answer. Finally, in 2005, the Supreme Court agreed to listen to a case, Boumedien versus Bush. The case centered on an article written at that point nearly 800 years earlier that you all know and love from the earlier presentation. 
No free man shall be seized and imprisoned except by the lawful judgment of his equals or by the law of the land. And if you read the, the court case of the argument, much of it goes back to, in fact, the events at Ronnie Mead in the early 13th century. Um, would, uh, you know, was it possible that a writ of habeas corpus could be served in the Channel Islands? What about Ireland? Okay, so they're, they're going back to the medieval and early modern period, trying to figure out the English legal situation. Uh, the happy news, for me at least, is that finally in 2008, the Supreme Court ruled in favor of Boumediene, and this decision began the release of many, though not all, of the det detainees. Now, after the excitement of 1215, Robert Fitzwalter and Eustace Vesey, who led the Barons' Revolt, may well have thought that the Magna Carta was something of a failure. Uh, Vesey dies a year later, and uh, Fitzwalter only survives another 12 years, 11 years. To them, at times, it might have seemed that John had won, or that the monarchy had run. In Professor Carpenter's words, the charter might well have seemed, shortly after running meet, a vague symbol of good government with limited practical consequences. But the document eventually proved its extraordinary value in England and in the wider world. Little wonder that just a few months back, when one group of activists were calling for a new document guaranteeing individual rights against international corporations, and another group was advocating for human rights, they were all talking about having a global Magna Carta in these areas. Now is scarcely the time for dewy-eyed apologists for empire, British or otherwise. Any attempt, no matter, high, no matter how high-minded, to subjugate other peoples, especially ones separated by custom, religion, and, and language, is bound to end in tears. Nevertheless, there are often powerful legacies of foreign rule. Let's imagine a variant of the famous Monty Python skit from the life of Brian and ask, what have the British ever given us? Okay? <laughs> Now, those going for cheap laughs, of course, might zero in first on food. Talk about toad in the hole, bubble and squeak, mushy peas, and start laughing, right? It, they're fine dishes, don't get me wrong, but they're not up there in the culinary events of the world. Now, eventually, the athletes, take them a while, you know how athletes are, but eventually they begin chanting out the holy litany. Well, the squash, okay, I'll give you squash, what else? Tennis, well, of course, goes on saying tennis. Golf, rugby, cricket, football. But before they could finish this debate, if we were redoing this skit now, the lawyers would have interrupted, and they would have rapidly brought all joking to a halt with two words, Magna Carta. It's arguably more important now to the Commonwealth, nay, to the entire world, than it was even to England in 1215. Thank you. Thank you to our distinguished speakers. I mean, I think we should, you know, we should have another round of applause. <laughs> Nearly 800 years ago, when King John actually sealed the accord in Runnymede in 1215, they didn't know we would be sitting today here in this part of the world debating and discussing the importance and really how Magna Carta has actually evolved over many, many years. Clearly, clearly. I mean, we, as, as they both have educated us um, in, a very, in a very short time, the influence and the impact of the basic principles um, of the basic human rights, which is actually doctrine in this charter. Now, before I actually I turn to you all, I am very much tempted uh, to ask our distinguished uh, speakers this evening a uh, few questions. My first question is very much to both of you all, and you know, very much um, interested to hear your thoughts and insights. Would you actually treat? this document or this charter as an Anglo-Saxon document versus, um, or versus um, an alien document? What would, what, would, what would be your sure. two minutes on this? Sure. Yeah. That's a good question, and it's one to which you would answer on the one hand and on the other. On the, on the one hand, I think, yes, um, Anglo-Saxon kings issued law codes, and it has been suggested that a, a code issued by King Canute um, was actually a sort of coronation charter, which is a precursor of Magna Carta, in which he made various concessions, limited his ability to take money in various ways. So I think the idea of the limitation of the king by a charter does go back to Anglo-Saxon times. On the other hand, um, I think 
it was also very much a product of 12th century government, and in particular government from 1154, which becomes more and more oppressive and intrusive, um, partly because of the cost of defending this continental empire. And also, as a result of the need for money, um, the English monarchy developed a system of government, a, a very powerful system of government, centred on this great institution called the Exchequer, of which, of course, um, George Osborne is the lineal descendant of the Exchequer, being the Chancellor of the Exchequer, which recorded everybody's debts. Remember, we looked at the, the Pike Pro and everything um, this morning. And, and so that it, there's far more need. Uh, Tom, Tom, was, uh, Thomas was asking me this question, why is there an English Magna Carta, not a French one, and so on? There's far more need of a Magna Carta in England because of this powerful intrusive government which you wish to resist and restrict, whereas French government was far more benign and um, it doesn't create the resentment in the same way. So it partly goes back to Anglo-Saxon times, but... The real need for the Charter is very much a 12th century uh, phenomena in England. Thank you, Professor Carpenter. Would you defer? Uh, I, you I, 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 I entirely, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you entirely yes, agree? yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Very much, okay. Which then takes me um, to something you mentioned, and you know, you talked about the Charter being discriminatory, mm. the Charter, you know, not um, enshrining women's rights, mm. which then takes me do you think today, we're not very far from 2025, mm. is the time right to maybe have a new Magna Carta for the world? Would, it, would a new Magna Carta be the answer for the idol? Would the new Magna Carta resolve all the, you know, um, all the issues and challenges which we face, you know, whether in Europe or whether in the Middle East? What are your thoughts? It might be a great idea. It's difficult to imagine how you're going to get everybody to agree to it, though. Mm. Mm. I think the key thing about the Charter is two things. The first is it has a principle that the ruler is subject to the law and that people have rights as against the ruler. The second is, of course, that it puts them down in black and white in a document. So the one answer to your question is, well, do we need a document giving people fundamental rights? Uh, the, the problem, of course, is that... Um, what may seem fundamental rights in one part of the world might not be fundamental rights in another part of the world. And so, I mean, that is something which, as Thomas said, it's very difficult to think of. Uh, can we have a universal declaration of human rights? And it's the universality which can create a problem. I mean, you know, one thinks of the uh, disasters which have taken place when the West has tried to fo foist its own model of, say, Western democracy on countries where it has no sort of cultural reference, really. And so there are real problems there. Agree. I also like the way you described it as a great idea, Lubna, but very difficult to implement. Yeah. But then just going back, if as a global community we share same principles, mm. right? If we could have a doctrine with guiding principles, not necessarily something um, which we all maybe have to sign to, but at least a document where it guides us all, because end of the day, it is a global community we live in, and anything happening in the Middle East, we see the after effects in Europe years mm, later, mm, mm. and, and, and. Um, so thank you for that. And, What's your and view? Um, my, well, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> well, my, I, I, I'm, very, you know, I'm very much a promoter. Um, um, a promoter of bringing the world together. And, and I know it's a very difficult concept. And, you know, you know the, the G8s and the, G, the G27s have proven to us it's very difficult to maybe get a global consensus on any issue we face. But I, don't, but I think the time is right. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't think we should wait any longer to at least have a universality and a consensus on guiding principles where we could all follow mm -hmm. in some form or the other. Mm -hmm. Which then takes me, um, which I'm very, very keen to hear your thoughts. UAE, of course, um, you know, being very much a business center um, in this part, you know, in this region. And um, early this year in February, the legal center of the world in London hosted um, a phenomenal uh, global legal summit where it brought together all the, you know, the legal kings and queens of the world to debate various issues. And one of and one of the debates um, 
which was very hot and topical, was the influence of rule of law in the world of business. And really want to hear your thoughts on it. Um, and, and, and you know, the effect the rule of law has in today's business. And of course, you touched upon the basis lies in money, the basis mm -hmm. lies in economics. I mean, if I, I, not that I have millions to invest, but I mean, if I was to do it, I would prefer to do it in a place that did follow some kind of rule of law <laughs> in general. I mean, I'm just it's a slightly facetious answer, but I mean, yes. <laughs> of course, that raises the question too, though, uh, you can have rules, but what happens when they're broken? Hmm. And of course, we've seen that in the Volkswagen case, hmm. haven't we? Where, um, you know, a great international company and lots of VWs all around um, uh, in the UEA, you know, and yet this great international company has been breaking the law, hasn't it? Uh, and has apparently got away with it. So it's a question of enforcement, too. Mm. Um, I mean, that, that's another real issue, I think, enforcement, in that you can have, on the one hand, a, uh, a Bill of Rights, a constitution, but how is it to be enforced? In America, of course, it's enforced by the Supreme Court. It could be. I mean, you will often. I, I fear Volkswagen may have some interesting court oh, well, cases. Yes, I didn't mean that specific case, but the American Constitution is enforced yeah. by the, mm. the, the Supreme um, Court. So, in a way, to, ha to have an effective Bill of Rights, you, you need an independent judiciary or some other mechanism. So, I, I was saying this morning that in 1215, what's fascinating about Magna Carta is that it didn't just subject the king to the law. It's also thought very, very hard about how to enforce that, and therefore it set up the 25 barons of the security Correct. cause who are actually empowered to seize the king's property, seize his castles, his lands, if he broke the charter. And in a way, that has a universal significance, isn't it? There's Absolutely. no point having a, a Bill of Rights or a written constitution if you've no means of enforcing Agreed. it. Agree, couldn't agree more. We say that uh, the Magna Carta was uh, like mainly mainly created for the instrumental or political purposes of the elite uh, uh, in the top. Oh, no. Okay, cheers. In the 12th century of England, and now we are in a way celebrating it as uh, like through the ideas from like in terms of ideas and how great ideas they were. Uh, I had a question like. Uh, uh, is it not taking it out of the context in a way? Well, I don't think it is entirely taking it out of its context because um, the principle of the rule of law, uh, I think, remains even if the beneficiaries then were limited. And, you know, it's the principle which is the really important thing. But I would also stress also the qualification I made that although parts of the Charter are just for elite, it does actually reach out to a much broader community. And, you know, OK, unfree are not protected, but actually free would make up 40% of the population, possibly 50% of the population. There are lots of free peasants. And so it, it does actually benefit very wide sections of, of society. So I don't think it is entirely taking it out of its context when we celebrate it this year. And that's why I disagreed with Lord Sumption's uh, view, view of the Charter. I have to admit, well, Abdullah Shamsi from the British University in Dubai. I have to admit, first of all, that it has been a very interesting talk. But uh, Professor David, you made it look as if history started in 1215. What I want to say here is, uh, well before then, we have the Romans, we had the Greek, and in 1215, you also had the Arabs in Spain, and I think you had a lot of interaction between mm -hmm. the, the Europe and the, and the, mm -hmm. and the Arabic mm -hmm. civilization at that time. Mm -hmm. Was there any influence in articulating this kind of document, influenced by the civilizations in the history? I mean, you've talked about 1215 onward, but what about 1215 backward? And how things, I mean, how was that developed? And, mm -hmm. and I, would, I would like to ask, uh, Professor Thomas, then another question after that. Well, Don, sorry, I was going so fast. And you're absolutely right, of course, that there is a long history before 1215 of these ideas. Um, the, the idea that the king is subject to the law, um, I mean, that goes back to the Christian Bible, it goes back to Roman law, 
Uh, and many of the things said in criticism of the Carolingian kings of the ninth century are identical to what was said against King John. So there's a much wider European context, and that was reinforced by the study of Roman law, theology, canon law in the 12th century universities throughout Europe. So these basic principles are very old, and you're so right about that, and European uh, and uh, what was different about Magna Carta was the sheer detail in which those principles were enforced uh, against, uh, across the whole range of government, local government, law, uh, feudal relations, the church and everything. And that's what made Magna Carta, even in its own time, different from some other European charters. But you're so right. I mean, there is a much, much wider context which I, I didn't really talk about. I would just okay. add that it, yeah. if you think about it, um, it, it really is, is the discussion about Magna Carta is in Britain and then former British dependencies. And the interesting one, I cited the Philippine example, which gets to the Philippines through the American colonization in the early 20th century. So for those people, this retrospective vision back is important. But for the rest of the world, it may or may not be important. And certainly there are other precedents that could be seen as equally important. I do have, I mean, there is a worry, right? Because the nations that are currently espousing the Magna Carta and having thousands of people fly to their capitals to talk about the Magna Carta, those nations, including those in Asia, common law nations in Asia, which say that they've used the Magna Carta for their constitution, statutarily have imprisonment without charge or trial in statute. They tolerate extrajudicial killings by drone. There are criminal trials in my country where the defendant cannot see their accuser and the public cannot gain access. There is the taking of foreign property nationals, you know, the property of foreign nationals without trial, without the ability for them to appear. And we have the starvation of legal aid for them, those most in need, the government taking money out of the legal aid system so those most in need cannot get legal representation to protect themselves from the very things the Magna Carta was there to protect. And these are in the nations that espouse the virtues of the Magna Carta. So what do we do about it to get that spirit back? Perhaps I could... <laughs> Comment, comment on that in, in, in two ways. First of all, to say that you're so right in, in this respect, in that um, the legal aid changes in Britain today, uh, Chapter 40 of Magna Carta, of course, has been cited uh, in opposition to them because it says to no one will we deny right or justice. Well, if you can't get money to fund your case, you are being denied right and justice. So Magna Carta has been cited in opposition to that. The other point, is, your whole point is actually encapsulated in the problem with, of chapter 39 of Magna Carta, which says no one is to be arrested, imprisoned, save by lawful judgment of his peers or by the law of the land. Now, in 1215, the law of the land was seen as a barrier against the king because he can't change it without the consent of the, uh, uh, of the great barons, and they're certainly not going to change the law of the land. And so the law of the land is there as an immovable block against the king. Whereas now, of course, the problem you're talking about has precisely arisen because the executive and legislature together, and if the executive controls the legislature, can do with the law of the land whatever it likes. And so it, there's nothing illegal or breaking Magna Carta in detention without, or potentially detention without trial, or any of those other things, because it has been legislated for by the executive. And so that comes back to the basic problem we'll all be talking about, as to whether we need to have a Bill of Rights in Britain or in other countries, which stop um, the tyranny of the executive and the legislature together, which, of course, you do have. In America, so there's certain things that in America the, Supreme Court, the, yeah. <laughs> the executive and the legislature can't do. Of course, in some ways, that might be a bad thing. Executive uh, and legislature can't, for example, take away your right to bear, ha to have guns.
in America because it's supposed to be enshrined in the Constitution. But, I mean, that does raise questions. You know, should there in all countries be some things which executive and legislature cannot do or can only do in, you know, by changing the, const the Constitution? So I, I agree with you. And that's a major issue we all face. I, I, I disagree with your assessment, and it'd be nice if we can fix it. But I do think the usefulness of the case is being able to have this incredibly ancient precedent that you can cite over and over again. And I think, you know, eventually, if you keep thumping away, that something happens. And the one, I mean, I remember, I haven't been very happy, I wasn't very happy with a number of actions the Americans, particularly under Bush, took. But when Supreme Court in 08 ruled in the Bermudian case, I was just ecstatic. It didn't free everybody, but it cleared out most of the mess. And that was a major step, in, for my money, in the absolutely right direction. And what guided that process was a long discussion about Magna Carta and what it meant at the time. So I mean, I, yes, there, there are obviously flaws in anything. But I think the notion of having this kind of amazing example early on can be very powerful and very useful. Mm -hmm. Communism, Communist Manifesto, actually, it's a creation after Magna Carta. Uh, both communism as well as Magna Carta was a revolt against the imperialistic view. One was a hard way and one was a soft way. How there is a relationship? How do you relate uh, the, the countries which follow the communism and uh, their principles in relation with Magna Carta? Thank you. Golly. That's a heavy question uh, yeah. for the last one. <laughs> Well, I'm going to St. Petersburg. This time next week, I shall be in St. Petersburg uh, talking about Magna Carta. So I'll have to think very carefully as to, as to how to address um, that. Um, I don't know. What do you think? I, I just, <laughs> just in my old readings about the Soviet Union, you could find statements of general principle in the Soviet Constitution, any of the ones that Joseph Stalin promulgated, that were even more amazing than anything mm. found in Magna mm. Carta. Mm. It, the critical question is gets to the enforcement clause. So mm. there, there weren't sadly any 25 barons that could bring Joseph Stalin to, to bear. But I mean, it's not simply, the rhetoric is magnificent, but it's a question of how you're going to actually implement it. Between, between the states and the process, that's what I see. Yeah. Mm. Is it true? I don't know. No. Well, thank you very much to all of you all who spared your evening with us. Thank you to our distinguished mm -hmm. speakers who have flown long flights to be here with us this evening. And this is our little contribution to celebrate 800 years mm -hmm. of Magna Carta. Mm -hmm.